This is the Anthology of Great Canadian Characters, published back in 1984, ISBN 0920792545, and Hubert Bach wrote an article in it where he called it and he ran and also ran and all he also ran and ran and ran about my running in all those elections and uh, a wonderful article picture me in there with my abolish interest rate sign when I was a young man <laughs> a long time ago 25 years ago and uh, Hubert Bott was a reporter for the Montreal Gazette and did a wonderful article explaining my motivations and my actions four years after I started my abolish interest rates project so the great Canadian character anthology a compendium of the country's zaniest personalities and it says, if you are still look upon Canadians as a bland and boring bunch, this book is guaranteed to change your mind. The Great Canadian Character Anthology will introduce you to a new breed of unforgettable personalities. Real people, true Canadians whose careers, hobbies, ideas, achievements, or passions make them great. This cross-country collection of a few of our more colorful characters allows you to travel a country meet these special people without ever having to leave your easy chair. Eden Press wonderful story explaining my motivations and my mission to date. He also ran and ran and ran Hubert Bach. Picture me, abolish interest rates, Johnny Engineer. He's a winner at the tables, loser at the polls. Little picture of me there. So, Ottawa, Ontario. On the morning after every election day, they find themselves facelessly lumped together in the dense, agate-type columns of the newspaper writing breakdowns as, quote, others, unquote. They are the fringe players of the political parties who operate without the brand name security that adherence to one of the major parties imparts. They are the vast army of independents of all stripes, social creditors of assorted colorations, western separatists, Quebec separatists, northern Ontario separatists, wildly clashing use of Marxists and our Leninists, fundamental communists, libertarians, rhinos, greens, and many, many more. They are a faceless legion marching out of step with each other to the beat of private drummers whose irresistible rhythms pound in their skulls, making them go out and march. They are never seen chatting with Mike Duffy on the National, generally the only media recognition they get as in the nether paragraphs of election time newspaper stories. Paragraphs that begin with, also running in effluent creek Sasquatch R... Dot, 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 unquote. In fact, the only times they are assured of getting their names in print are on the ballot itself. And in the final report of the chief electing, chief returning officer, who dutifully records their participation along with their inevitable dismal vote tallies that once more injure the sustaining illusion that maybe this time they could beat the odds. It is therefore consistent that we should find the name of John C. Termell in the returning officer's report, buried deep in the field of candidates who contested the federal riding of Beaches last summer. It was an eight-man race and Termell finished seventh just like in Guelph. Beaches has a reputation as a granola-fed, upperly mobile constituency, widely hailed as the creeping white paint center of Metro Toronto, and the major papers rated it as one of the most exciting individual riding contests in the country, one in which all three of the major parties had a clear shot at winning. Eventually, Neil Young retained it for the NDP with 14,900 votes to 12,000 for Conservative Jack Jones and 8,000 for Terry Kelly of the Liberals. Between them, they accounted for 96% of the ballots. Few people paid attention to the other five guys who staged their own race for the remaining 4%. Here, judging from the result, the real contest was to avoid finishing last. It was a fate that would have befallen John Turmel had it not been for one Ron Thurston standard bearer for the Commonwealth Party, who wound up with 27 votes in his column, or 0.07% of the grand total. Termel could take comfort that he whipped this guy good with his own 285 votes and 0.31%. Still, he'd take it in the year from the libertarian wimp who wound up with 353 votes, and he was way behind the upstart from the Greens who came close to breaking 600. That hurt a bit. After all, John Termel isn't just another fringer. He's the current king of the fringers. Compared to John Turmel, most of these characters are mere fly-by-nighters. At age 34, Turmel is the Dr. Gonzo of fringe politics. Dr. Gonzo being a young 
enthusiastic doctor from, I believe, the Trapper John Doctor series in the early 80s. Not insulting. He works the fringe with a vengeance, and he works it full time. He runs in every election he can get to, federal elections, provincial elections, and by-elections. He has run for public office 19 times during the past six years. Not only does he run often, he runs hard. He's loud and outrageous, and though most people try to ignore him wherever he goes, he has a way of making himself noticed. In the morgue of his hometown paper in Ottawa, his file is thicker than of most members of the current cabinet. There are pictures of him in his trademark white hard hat with the engineer stenciled across the front, picketing the Bank of Canada head office with a huge sign that declares bankers are crooks. Here's one from 82 where he's being led out of the International Monetary Fund general meeting by two Toronto constables. This time the sign says bankers starve third world babies. Here is a cover that explains the latter sign. Turmel dragged Bank of Canada Governor Gerald Bowie before the Supreme Court, claiming that the bank's interest rate policy is genocidal because it drives farmers into bankruptcy at a time when people are starving in Ethiopia. He himself has lost count of the number of times he's launched court actions against banks, but he figures he's getting close to 200. This was by 1984, and I started in 1980, remember? Here he is up against the Canadian Radio Television Telecommunications Commission in the Federal Court of Appeal claiming he was discriminated against because the local CTV outlet didn't give him equal time during one of his election runs. There are various accounts of stunts he pulled during his various election campaigns, most notably the time he ran for mayor of Ottawa in 1980. And hello, what have we here? An item that recounts how John Turmel was sentenced to three weeks in jail for running what authorities insisted was an illegal blackjack game in the basement of an all-night restaurant on Bank Street. Other politicians, even of the fringe variety, might be inclined to regard such a conviction as detrimental to career in public life, but not John Turmel. He freely admits he earns his living playing cards, and he insists it was the conviction for running the game on Bank Street that led him into politics. Today happens to be Thursday, so John and his brother Ray are in the ramshackle two-room suite they occupy in a low-rent two-story box-like structure on the unfashionable edge of Ottawa's center town. But what do you want for poor people, right? They are preparing for their weekly march on Parliament Hill in the Bank of Canada. We're at the Bank of Canada about noon every Thursday, says John. Ray lets John do all the talking. Then about 1.30 we move up to picket Parliament Hill. We've been doing the Bank of Canada for about four years and Parliament for three. It's been effective, eccentric, and a little out of the ordinary, but effective. The boys are freshly back from Atlantic City, where they say they had an outstanding weekend. See here, says John, reaching into a filing cabinet drawer beside the desk. He comes up with a brown envelope and pulls an inch-thick wad of $100 bills. God, he says, gave me the gift to walk into the game and walk out with all the cash. He's a card counter who's mastered the knack of keeping track of cards that have been played from a given deck in a blackjack game and taking advantage of the shortening odds as the game progresses. He says he's been barred from casinos in Vegas, but Atlantic City is still prime territory. They haven't caught on there yet, he says. I play craps, too. I used to go to Vegas, and it was only blackjack, and they'd say, card counter, you know, throw them out. Now I go in and I play craps, too. I mix up a game where I can't win with a game where I do win. He says a natural aptitude for mathematics led him to bridge and into blackjack, which he played throughout his university careers at Carleton, where he took a degree in electrical engineering. He also showed enough expertise in the mechanics of blackjack that he was subsequently hired as the teaching assistant in the mathematics department for a course on gambling. That lasted for four years before he was abruptly dismissed for running a widely publicized blackjack game in a Carleton faculty lounge. By then, he was heavily involved in the campaign to legalize gambling by running games under the noses of the local police department, inviting them to come and arrest him. They did this on several occasions, and each time Termel defended himself, claiming he had observed obscure provisions of the criminal code that rendered his games technically legit. A succession of magistrates was unimpressed with his arguments until 1989. In February 1982, he was dispatched to spend two weeks in the Ottawa Regional Detention Center, where he spent most of his time playing cards. Imagine that! I get put away for having a deck of cards, and look what I wind up doing. In September, he was back on the same charge. This time he got a choice. No card playing for three years, or 21 days in jail. He chose the 21 days. I couldn't face three years without intellectual stimulation, he said as they led him away.